The Old Testament reading for this the 13th Sunday after Pentecost is taken from the prophet Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter, again, the 23rd verse. Am I only a God nearby, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Can anyone hide in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do not I fiddle heaven and earth, declares the Lord. I have heard what the prophets say who prophesy lies in my name. They say, I had a dream, I had a dream. How long will this continue in the hearts of these lying prophets who prophesy the delusion of their own minds? They think the dreams they tell one another will make my people forget my name, just as their fathers forgot my name through Baal worship. Let the prophet who has a dream tell his dream, but let the one who has my word speak faithfully. For what has straw to do with grain? declares the Lord. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? And this is the word. Thanks be to God. Jesus is 
But our Lord here reminds us that it is his word that tells us what is true reality. And that can be shattering because we like our idols. The reason we don't keep any of the other commandments fully and perfectly is we don't keep the first commandment perfectly. And we do not want to be dependent upon the Lord. In the author from Hebrews, he invokes how sometimes that our dependence upon God may look just the opposite. As if God has abandoned us. He reminds them, you are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. He reminds them to look how God has worked in the past. And why are we surprised then when he works the same way in our lives? We tend to be. These great cloud of witnesses are the martyrs. Those who even gave up their lives for the faith. And he uses this to say, to throw off the sin that easily entangles us, this desire to be independent. He compares it to running a race. And by the way, uh, life is a marathon, not a sprint, if you haven't figured that out yet. To persevere, to remain where Jesus is. The author says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. What you're doing now, fixing your eyes on Jesus, where he has promised to be for you, to deliver the goods that he accomplished and achieved for you, the forgiveness of sins. His cross, we heard about it this Saturday's Holy Cross Day. His cross in distinction to our cross. But there are two crosses his cross has attained our salvation. But because we are his, Satan is not happy. The world is not happy. And our old Adam is not happy. These three enemies of our dependence upon God work in tangent to try to get us to want to be independent and to ignore God. Oh, I don't need to go to church this Sunday. That's a statement of independence. I don't need to. But we do. We are dependent upon him. When we start to think our faith is so strong that we don't need those means of grace which create faith, then our faith has now become in our faith. And not in Christ. We come, as Luther said, we're the poor beggars. We come where he is giving out the gifts. Not independent in our own will, but depending upon him in everything. The Lord drives this dependence home to us by allowing us to experience the Holy Cross. And it comes in many shapes and sizes and forms. But it comes. Luther made that point in the opening thing I read. He who is not a Crucianus is not a Christianus. Who he does not experience the Holy Cross is not a Christian. But that, the author of Hebrews tells us, is a good thing. Because he says what? Well, it's the Lord's discipline. And again, it can come in many shapes and sizes. In the Old Testament, it can come from the temptation of false teachers. That's a big one in our day and age. There are TV preachers who are very popular who preach health, wealth, and prosperity gospel and never talk about what Jesus is talking about here, picking up your cross. It's a very popular message among even Christians. And it, of course, plays to our desires, too. And Jesus reminds us that is not how it's to be. There are false teachers all over the place who play to our intellect or to our emotions. Intellect. Doesn't this make sense to you? Is it, wouldn't God do that? Or to our emotions. Well, I just, it just doesn't make me feel good. How did the gospel lesson make you feel today? 
I did not come to bring peace, but fire. And our Lord says he has a baptism to undergo. I'll talk about that in a sec. But it isn't just false teachers that can allure us and cause divisions in the church. The church is always, there's a, sometimes a tendency to, to romanticize. If I only live in the time of C.F.W. Walther, you know, as a pastor dealing with issues in the church generally today, and then I read about how they had divisions and problems. And <laughs> it's always been this way because Luther says, wherever God plants a church, Satan plants his chapel right next door to it. Even within. Satan never, ever gives up. And it can impact us in our religious life. It may be that we at some point have to leave a church where we've had, you know, all our life friends and some of you have experiences. I know. Members here come from other places. Because those churches were no longer proclaiming God's word properly and faithfully. And that is hard. It's hard. When we witness to Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, it's hard because in many cases, they are going to have to do what? Choose Jesus over family ties, friendships, the things that bind us together, the good gifts that God intends but that Satan uses to become <laughs> idols. It can, in fact, even be something like this. Five in one family. It can even come into the household where sons and daughters, moms and dads are not in agreement on the faith. It happens because of this desire on our part to be independent and not to depend solely upon the Lord. It is the old satanic lie that Satan has been proclaiming since the beginning. You can be like God. The problem with that is we make pretty bad gods. In the words of a uh, recent movie, puny gods. Not much. But we have a God who is not so puny where you and I are selfish and want to have, you know, uh, everything be our way, he becomes one of us for our sins. Jesus says, I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it is completed for you, for us. And the baptism he's talking about here is baptism by fire. It's the cross. You see, when we are God, we not only are independent, we really only care about ourselves, ultimately. But not so our Lord. His love is so deep and strong for you. In the words of the author of Hebrews, he endured the cross, scorning its shame for you. He, or rather, we can be dependent on him because he's proved his dependability. He has paid for the sins of the whole world. It is he, that Jesus, that Savior, your Savior, who points you to the thought and says, you're mine. I'm not going to let Satan pull you away. the same Lord Jesus who points us to his body and blood of the sacrament and says, here, be fed. Receive me. Receive my forgiveness. Because ultimately, that's the one thing that will hold as everything else in the world falls apart. We are living in a fallen world and because it's fallen, there's going to be division. The world, Satan clearly, and even our own flesh doesn't want the world to be redeemed. We're quite happy with it the way it is, as long as until it impinges upon us. Until that other sinner treats me like I am treated. 
treat other people. We want to be independent, not just independent from God, but from one another. Unless you do something for me, unless you help me in some way, unless you make me feel good in some way. But again, our Lord has done it for us. Not that he gains anything other than us, right? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that Thanks be to God. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus always. Amen. Amen.